the Kansas City Public Library. I also run the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion, and we're really thrilled to have you here today. And we're also really thrilled to have the newly appointed FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks here today. It's such an honor to have you here and a true champion of digital inclusion. So really happy about that. I'd also like to acknowledge another rock star in the room, and that is Angela Stever. Could you stand up for a second, please? <laughs> the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and she has also uh, been tireless in her work for digital inclusion. We really appreciate the work that she does nationally for all of us. Um, one more quick person to mention in the room, and that's my boss, <laughs> uh, Library Director Crosby Kemper is in the very back, Crosby. <laughs> Aside from being the Library Director and always willing to work on digital inclusion initiatives, both locally, regionally, nationally, he is the uh, chairman of Shelby, which is uh, the chairman of Schools Health Libraries and Broadband Coalition. So he is very committed to this work as well. Okay, so I do have a quick, couple of quick housekeeping notes very, very quickly, since this is a coalition meeting after all. <laughs> this is our mission and our vision. I'm not going to go through it, you can find it on our website. In the back, you can please sign in or check in, that way you'll always be added to our email list and you'll get all of the updates that we have each month. If you park across the street, please validate your parking so you can get out for free. Wi-Fi is library and password is historic. This is how you can connect with us uh, through the coalition. We hope you do it often and with all of your events throughout the week or the month. And I just wanted to mention our next meeting next month since after um, Commissioner Stark speaks, we'll, we will end the meeting. And we have a special guest speaker, that's Alan Howes. Alan is the Wi-Fi County and Kansas City, Kansas Unified Government uh, Technology Officer. He is he's been doing great things there, and we're really happy to hear from him. Okay, so it wouldn't be a coalition meeting if we didn't go through it. Every single person is going to have to introduce themselves, their organization, and just one sentence about what you do and why you're here supporting the coalition. Hi, I'm Leslie Stafford, and I'm the Board of Kansas City Missouri Systems Admin, and I'm here because I'm the same as my class. Hi, I'm Angela Seifer, National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, I live in Columbus, Ohio, so I'm going to go Good afternoon. Domingo Lynn with Metropolitan Community College in Valley. I serve on the Security Council here, and uh, just same as you all. Support uh, Chris Arrow on behalf of Verizon, the uh, outreach uh, engineer here. I'm Andy Hyde, I'm a council member in Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, I serve on a few FCC uh, advisory committees, and I am one of the Mr. Sharp. Jason Atkins, I'm the uh, president of United Private Networks. We're a uh, fiber provider that's uh, headquartered here in Kansas City, but we operate in 21 states and work with a lot of schools, libraries, government organizations, as well as other enterprises. And we like doing good things for Kansas City because this is our hometown. So <laughs> we're always supportive of that. Rick Usher, assistant city manager with the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and also our Facebook Live camera operator. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Aaron Nathan, the managing director of PC Digital Drive. I'm a steering council for the coalition. I'm Dave Crum. I'm the digital branch manager here at Kansas City Public Library. And I help out the steering council and support the work of the coalition. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Sykes. And this is my eighth day as the interim director of the WEB Du Bois Learning Center. And I have a freshman at Harvard. Hey now! <laughs> uh, Jim Feathers, I'm a technology lawyer with Students on the Street and a uh, board member with uh, Connecting for Good and a supporter of the commission. Thank you. Uh, Mallory Aguilar, I work with Waterloo Bank Centers um, as an employment specialist, so helping the community find work throughout the area. I'm Elvira Cunningham, and I'm the Director of Workforce at the Waterloo Bay Center. And we're just trying to create more opportunities for our students, as well as um, for our participants. So just trying to learn more about the different opportunities for them. I'm Bernie Arcanini. I work at the Cooper Branch at the Kansas Public Library. 
where I mainly work with people on computers. I'm Dries. I'm Amanda Barnhart. I am the manager of the Northeast Branch Library. Thank you, Steve Williams, Ginger and Neighborhood Association, support digital inclusion. I am Brian Ball, Senior Art Neighborhood Association, and we are here to get as much information as we can to go back and go back to the I'm Susan Norris from Family Select. We do IT and business consulting and we do the support of communities as we can. I am Jeremy Hoover, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. I work in community development and I'm here to the Digital Inclusion Institution Foundation to do some other areas of your community development. Ron Sullivan, I am the Tech Access Volunteer Coordinator, Mayor for the Center at Kansas City Public Library. Uh, my name is Owen Gordon. I'm with the Tech Access team here at the library. I'm the Mayor of Vista, and I'm a curriculum and data admin. Good afternoon. I'm Jose Davis. I'm with the Kansas Department of Housing and Urban Development here in the Kansas City Regional Office. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Armel. I'm also with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Gabriel yeah, Fumero from HDC, Spanish Economic Development Corporation. I am the Digital Literacy Program Manager. Hello, everyone. I'm Eli Davis, the Employment Specialist at the Healing House. I'm Chris Allen with Goodwill of uh, Western Missouri, Eastern Kansas, and I teach the Digital Skills Training in uh, North Star Assistance. I'm Rick Dean, and you all mostly know me as one of the founders of Connecting Commit. Wendy Pearson, I'm here at the Kansas City Public Library. I help develop and now oversee the Tech Access uh, Program, which is a collection of resources that helps us um, serve our adult patrons and help them reach their goals in digital literacy and workforce skills. My name is Marvin Robinson, and I'm a part of the Clinton Ruins Underground Railroad Exercise 2019. Uh, the other day, Tuesday, the U.S. House of Representatives confirmed the vote in the Senate on S-75 public lands, lands uh, bill. And so our legislation, according to Senator Roberts, is at the uh, waiting desk for President Trump's signature for our National Criminal Society. And I would like to say this. I am not very good with computers, and when I spent two months and three weeks studying the webinar uh, and the sample letters and redraft and sending it to people all over the country. When we had time to do the letter, I had to go down to connect to the field on Third Street. I'm over in Kansas, and they were able to whip it up real, real good and even had a graphic design on the front. And I just could not be more grateful to the digital inclusion group for being here for the underserved. Right. Good afternoon, my name is Erin Bob. I'm here with the Heartland Tree Alliance. We're a program with Bridge and Ahab, which is the 27 year old largest nonprofit here in Kansas City. I'm here to hear Mr. Sparks speak and also just work together with this group because we serve the same community, even though what we bring might be different, but it's the same people. So. Good afternoon, I'm Anna McGemory, one of the steering uh, committee members for the Digital Inclusion Coalition, also uh, owner, executive director of Urban Tech. TEC is the acronym for Technology in Our Community, travel with urban schools and communities to teach them um, and expose them to 21st century technology. <laughs> Hi, my name is Becca Rendell. I work here at the Kansas City Public Library in our Refugee and Immigrant Services and Empowerment Division, as well as with our AmeriCorps Vista Graduate. Oh, you're up. <laughs> right. uh, my name is Dr. West Farm. I'm with the Urban Scholastic Center in Wyandotte, Kansas. We provide educational preparation to Richard and Tank Service for K-12. Alan Adams, Chief Financial Officer for the UK Government of Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County. And people are just connecting outside to share exchange information and follow up on this. Um, I'm Steve Weaver. I uh, work with Carrie in uh, Public Affairs at the uh, Kansas City Public Library. Right away. Right. 
stations are always filled with people. Or the groups of entrepreneurial residents working on online resource applications down the street at the City of Kansas City, Missouri's BizCare office. Or the senior citizens and other residents enjoying free computer access at the Vineyard Neighborhood Association. And we have Ike and Destiny here. I'm so glad you all can make it. Uh, one of the most loyal attendees of our coalition meetings. Uh, or the hundreds of income challenged residents taking advantage right now of the LIA, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, free tax service centers around the greater Kansas City metro area. All that to know that our collective efforts as a coalition dedicated to digital inclusion is making a difference in the lives of those who need a difference the most. Today we're honored and excited to have as our guest a man whose entire career has been devoted to protecting consumers, especially, especially the marginalized populations of our country who lack a voice in matters that affect communication, connectivity, opportunities, and pathways to be productive citizens in today's digital world. Jeffrey Starks was nominated to serve as a commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission by the President and was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate on January 2nd, 2019. He was sworn into office on January 30th, 2019, um, less than a month ago. And he's here in Kansas City. Hello. <laughs> what we're doing in Kansas City matters. Um, just, just so you know, three of the many issues, but three of the current issues the FCC controls has direct implications for our digital inclusion work. Uh, one of them is net neutrality. That's regulations that ensure equal access to internet content. Another one is lifeline. That's subsidies that help low-income families offset the cost of phone and internet service. And a third one is e-rates. That's subsidies to reduce the cost for schools and libraries. Uh, of the use of the internet. Now, Commissioner Starks, he's had a long career of public and private sector experience. These experiences inform his commitment to working to ensure that no American is left behind in this era of transformative innovation. Most recently, Commissioner Starks served as the Assistant Bureau Chief in the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. Previously, he served as Senior Counsel in the Office of the Deputy Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice, where he received the Attorney General Award for exceptional service. That's the highest award a DOJ employee can receive. 
probably most exciting as that commissioner starts with born right here in Kansas City. Uh, he attended Rockhurst High School, uh, Harvard College, and Yale Law School. He currently lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Lauren, and the two children. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Jeffrey Sykes. Thank you, thank you, everybody. This really has um, uh, been a homecoming. It is my, it is no mistake that my first events traveling uh, as a commissioner are here to Kansas City. It is my home. Um, it's where I was, uh, I grew up and was raised, where I had the, 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 the most warm feeling. But I gotta tell you, it's also, I kind of, and, and I'll be interested in talking to everybody more, uh, truly. Uh, but there seem to be kind of two narratives, two stories that are going on here. Let me take a step back. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Angela, for all of your service. Thank you, Carrie, uh, as well, um, uh, for this invitation to talk to y'all um, and to, to, to begin to share uh, how I'm thinking about approaching being a commissioner. Um, uh, and and uh, I know this will be a productive conversation and dialogue, not only today, but going forward. Um, the two narratives, the two stories that I see here in Kansas City, one, uh, of course, is um, um, the Wi-Fi that I'm hearing about, how is it truly one of the very first smart cities. Uh, hearing about um, how 5G is going to come here later on in the year. Hearing about Google Fiber. I'll be interested to hear what the real lived experience is for folks um, um, that have experienced that. But on the other hand, I'm hearing uh, as well and reading about how Missouri generally is 41st in the country on internet access. Uh, and that includes both a rural and an urban component. Uh, because we have uh, so many folks that are getting left behind and we just can't have that. It's too important for folks to be connected with their loved ones, uh, for folks to be able to connect with their businesses, with their healthcare, with their doctor, connecting. Uh, for educational purposes. Um, uh, and that's both the youth and and, um, and and folks that are, I was reading earlier today uh, about how 77% of jobs by 2022, 2022, that's not that far away, are gonna have a technological component to them. Uh, and so for folks that need more skills, Folks that need to make sure that they can maintain the skills that they need, get more skills to make sure their job, they're able to perform their job, uh, it's going to be critically important. Um, but let me start uh, at the beginning, which is uh, I grew up you know, on the Kansas side uh, where my folks uh, still live. And, and um, uh, my mother was a guardian at light in the state of Kansas. Oh, I thought that was somebody giving a shout out to Marty and I'm like, uh, they need a shout out, they deserve a shout out. It really is. Um, uh, they, they serve children in need of care. They literally are appointed by the state um, for kids that are in need of care. So I, I deeply value seeing her work hard to protect the most vulnerable, uh, as Tom was saying. Uh, and that message and that impact that she brought for those kids, for those families, is something that deeply resonated with me uh, and, and brought me to my life of service. Um, uh, and so, grew up with my parents as role, role models, uh, Rockers High School, uh, men for others. Uh, and so, I'm happy to say that that was, again, a, a training on um, how important it is to serve. Um, and so I left, uh, obviously, like you heard, for colleges on the East Coast, law school on the East Coast. Um, but I've never forgotten my commitment uh, to Kansas City. And so when I get started, it's no mistake that I'm back here at my hometown. Um, so I've, I've been in the month now in my job at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, we do a lot more than censoring uh, bad language. Uh, net neutrality, I'm sure folks have also heard a lot of. Uh, and that certainly kind of put the FCC um, uh, in more of a household name. But, the, but one of my very first priorities here 
uh, really is focusing on closing the digital divide. And, and a lot of people ask me, how did I get started doing this? How did you become an MCC commissioner? Uh, what got you started in the telecom sector? Um, and it really was about 11 or 12 years ago um, when I was back here of all places uh, getting a haircut in my barbershop. Uh, it was down on Paseo, which I understand is now called Martin Luther King Boulevard. Yeah. Yes, amen to that. Uh, and so I'm getting a haircut in, uh, in, in the barbershop, and we're debating sports, talking sports like a lot of folks. Like we only do in black arm shop. Uh, and so uh, it was one of those things where I maintain people were wildly wrong to this day. We hadn't been talking about the Chiefs. Um, where people have a lot of opinions, but I don't think they always have the right facts. Right? Um, and so I got to, you know, I remember like yesterday where I got up from getting my hair cut and I said, let's all go home, look it up on the internet, I'll come back next time I get a cut. We'll see who's right and who's wrong. And people start looking at me with all of them out on the internet. What's he talking about? Uh, and it quickly became real to me that I was the only person in the room that had internet in my home, which was in an apartment. Um, and I remember thinking, somebody's got to do better. That, that can't, this, this can't be. Whose job is it to make? the change. Turns out now it's my job. It's our job. So we got to do better. Because I got to be honest with you, I don't know if that's a number now, it's still, even still 11, 12 years later, 50% of black and brown homes still don't have internet, fixed internet to their homes. And, you know, I don't, I don't want my phone to go off. We all know these phones do more than they used to, but it's still hard to get your resume ready on your phone, right? When you're looking at it's still hard to get the educational needs served that you need when you're dealing with it on your phone. We need to get internet still to the homes. You have to be connected in this digital world in order to succeed. Um, and so uh, one of the things I was reading about when I was preparing for our meeting today that I really would be interested in hearing folks, I don't know if we're going to have Q&A, otherwise please come up and talk to me, uh, is how what folks have found here is that there is a good internet option on the ESAC uh, that is well priced. And there still is um, a lack of kind of uptake on that. And so I'll be interested to hear folks' ideas and theories and thoughts because affordability is actually a critical component that I'm starting to think through in my job. $2,700 is what the average American family spends for the internet, for their phone, for their cable. $2,700. And for a lot of folks, you know, we talk about this as bridging, bridging the digital divide, but for a lot of folks, that's just a bridge too far, right? $2,700 a month, a month, uh, I mean, $2,700 a year. And so that's a number that I think with additional competition, um, uh, that number's got to become more affordable for folks to be able to get the internet that we all know that they need. Um, and uh, um, Lifeline is a critical, critical component to lifting folks. Um, it's a critical pathway out of poverty for folks. Um, folks that need it for connecting with their family, connecting with their jobs, connecting with their health care. Um, and some of you, not to get too inside baseball, but some of you may know that Lifeline is under assault uh, these days. Um, and uh, the chairman has proposed a, uh, a rulemaking to, to, to drastically cut back uh, what Lifeline is going to look like. Um, and so I am I'm fighting uh, on that, uh, and we'll continue to fight on that. Uh, but Lifeline is something that we absolutely need to make sure um, that we are, are continuing to, to provide uh, for folks to make sure that they can lift themselves out of poverty. Um, and and uh, I'm going to fight to protect it. Telehealth is also something that I'm starting to think uh, think through. Uh, you know, I I know um, as the son of a doctor uh, practices in Kansas and Missouri, 
Um, I, I think it's it's absolutely essential that we be able to have healthcare meet folks where they are. Uh, and and for a mother of three to have to spend hours getting cross town to, to, to meet with her healthcare provider, I think in a lot of instances there will be a way where um, she can meet with her physician in a different way, be able to have that quality of life that the internet really affords. And um, uh, the other thing I would say is obviously we know the prime example is that uh, telemedicine and telehealth is really helping with the opioid uh, and the crisis that um, has, has come about and making sure that people get uh, the health care that they need. Um, but I would really say that I'm more eager to listen today than I am to really talk. I'm only a month into the job. I know how I'm thinking about issues, but I really am interested in hearing from folks uh, what your lived experience is. Um, Kansas City is such a microcosm of where the internet is here, where it seems like the haves are getting more of it, uh, like 5G. And I'm all for 5G, no mishearing, because um, I think the technological advances, um, artificial intelligence, smart cities, smart living, uh, um, uh, driverless cars, I think it's going to change the way we all live and the way we all interact. But what I'm really interested in is making sure that we leave no community behind. Uh, because it is just so important uh, in our modern world that um, kids not only uh, have the competency that they need, um, but are prepared to innovate, uh, which is the American, um, the American way of life, that they're getting the tools that they need uh, to drive us into the future. And then again, um, in particular, we know here in Kansas City, uh, 5G is coming. Um, and the, you know, the real truth about that is that uh, a, a lot could potentially get automated uh, as, a, as a result of 5G. And so making sure that we are training folks to be able to take on those types of jobs, making sure that we're seeing around the corner to make sure that folks are being able to take on what are those modern jobs. And whether that's getting you more skills, getting you upskilled, um, I want to make sure that we're doing that. And, Connecting for good in some of these programs. I'm going to go visit there later today, and I'm excited to see how they're helping to close the, the homework gap, how they're helping to get equipment and access out there. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to hearing from you. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Jonas Walker with the Black Family Technology and Awareness Association. And I do wonder about net neutrality and the FCC's position on that. If we're going to be able to keep the internet open and, and as low cost, because it's not free. People do say it's free, but open and low cost so that the corporate side or the Netflixes and all of those don't get the big benefit of it and that the small person or the home person is left, you know, just getting their crumbs. So I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, and uh, you know, um, I think the internet has to remain open, has to remain free. Uh, the way that the internet Title II that we had, um, we collectively back in the Obama administration, there was a certain way that the internet was going to be um, regulated, uh, and that was to make sure that. Folks were being transparent about what they were going to do. There was going to be no blocking, no throttling, yeah. no paid prioritization of where there are fast lanes and, and slow lanes, and you know a lane that most of us have to go through, but then somebody else can have a, 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 a new lane. Yeah. Um, that was all rolled back um, under uh, under this administration. I disagree with that strongly. Uh, I think the most important thing you can do right now. Uh, is contact your uh, representative, uh, your, uh, your congressional representative, your senate representative, because uh, it's going to have to be a legislative fix right now. There's nothing that we can do at FCC anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but I completely agree with you that um, uh, when you're talking about fast lanes and slow lanes, and when you're talking about um, uh, certain 
edge provide when you're talking about certain folks being able to charge you more uh, to get the service that you know you need that's a problem um, and so I think something has to be done about that and and uh, it really is congressional need to have to be dealt with that question over here yeah thank you do you see any uh, anything in the future to require service providers to advertise a guaranteed minimum speed or an average speed? Uh, it's, it's one of the few things I think that, that we're going to say, okay, we'll, we'll get up to a certain speed, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine a gas station advertising, we're going to sell a gallon of gas or up to a gallon of gas for three dollars, and then you only get it pork because they're really busy that day and there's too much demand, but they still charge you three dollars for the gallon. Yeah. So it, the answer is, I think it's going to be very difficult, uh, truth be told. Um, it, it, you know, reasonable network management is is uh, a difficult concept because you know folks that are streaming their tenth movie uh, versus somebody who's trying to get a healthcare um, um, uh, connection to go through. You know, I do think there should be a way that folks can make sure that uh, the high prioritized stuff goes through that way. And it's also very hard to actually technically measure how fast your internet is going. But I do take your point um, that if you are saying that you have a certain speed, uh, it should be around that for your experience. And so for folks to say, uh, you know, 25.3 is the standard that we typically have here, but folks will tell you um, at any given time, any given moment, it may not even close to that. Pricing information generally is something that I'm trying to think through because um, uh, the data that we receive here at the FCC on what, what our consumers paying and for what so that we can compare uh, to make sure that folks just because you cross an imaginary line truly uh, in certain cities and your rate goes up or your speed goes down uh, there's a lot of different ways that we could, could um, figure out if we could get more accurate data. And so data is something generally that I'm very interested in at the FCC and making sure that we can start to get a better understanding of how uh, our broadband actually uh, the lived experience that people have with their broadband. Next question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kendra Burgess. I'm a Posse Corporate Home Person. And I had a chance to hear you this morning at the Summit. And uh, thank you for taking such a strong stance um, on protecting the right line. Yeah. Um, I spoke with um, our CEO, Julie DeGene, and I said, you know, they're considering these cuts to the lifeline program, how many of our consumers rely on this um, for their uh, health services. And if you don't know, we provide people with disabilities mm -hmm. um, in home health care, um, different resources so they can remain living in the home. And she said, oh, for sure, at least 50% of our uh, consumers and people we serve rely on my um, people with disabilities. Um, also, the PCAs that serve them who give them the care in their homes. And so, what can we do to help you fight that fight? Um, and to spread that message, I would love to even notify, um, you know, others, um, other centers for independent living um, in our area about that. Yes, and so I'm going to give you the technical answer, uh, and then I think I'm going to go where, where Reverend Representative Cleveland went this morning, uh, which is making sure that that folks um, uh, get out there and vote generally. I don't mean that to talk to any particular party either which way, uh, so I don't get in trouble that way. Um, but making sure that that uh, that folks know where you stand on issues like this is critically important. The technical answer to your question is that it's an open proceeding right now, which basically means there's a there's an open case right now pending before me at the FCC on whether we're going to have cuts to Lifeline, and those cuts are going to be whether there's a a national cap on how much money can go under Lifeline. Whether you can uh, have a have Lifeline over the life of your period as somebody who um, is is um, a low income, there's a potential cap on that. There's a potential uh, way that if certain resellers, people who resell uh, 
um, these, these phone packages, if you eliminate them, it's really going to cut off almost 70% of people from being able to have their lifeline phones. And so that's something that's being proposed right now. Uh, and so I don't, I don't agree with any of that. Um, the best thing that you can do is, uh, again, I have a certain way that I can land a punch in DC, but if all you all speak up, um, that punch can land a little bit harder. Uh, and so that item is still open. We haven't made a decision on it yet. And so file a comment, go to FCC.gov and file a comment. Um, um, work with, with groups to help file comments. You can have uh, the visual inclusion file a comment. You guys should file comments. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and more than that, even, um, you know, and I think I shared this this morning as well, is that Lifeline is critical for so many folks, for veterans, um, for low income folks, um, uh, folks that are working hard to pull themselves out of poverty. Um, and and, and uh, it's important to tell that story. So tell you, tell the story. Find folks who are lifeline beneficiaries and tell that story. Um, how it's helped them, what it's meant to them, what it, what would it, it cost to lose that, um, and and tell that story. Because because then I can share the story. Somebody else will read the story and uh, and be impacted by it. Susan. This actually touches on the awareness issue as well. So, in, in the last couple of days, I've heard a public official talk about his idea for solving digital violence by putting Wi Fi access in trees in parks. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we need. We have a lot of work to do to make people understand the scope of what's going on here. Yeah. How can the FCC help us do that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, I'd be interested to hear from folks on that, to be honest. Um, you know, I do think uh, digital literacy is such an important part of making sure that. Uh, from a policy perspective, I was I was having my own thoughts, um, but making sure that folks again getting back to this point, of, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit boggled and, and baffled right now. You know why it is, and maybe this is the case in other cities because from my perspective, there's something called digital redlining, which is basically where um, you know in urban centers most usually uh, when you cross the proverbial railroad tracks. People don't get high speed internet anymore. And that's a real problem to me. That makes me angry. Um, and, and, and I do think, thanks to your work, Angela, you know, we have been able to see a couple instances where that, that really is the case. And I'm going to take that up with those providers when they come to see me. Um, but I am, you know, like anything where there's no easy answers, um, you know, here in, that, here in Kansas City, there are very competitive options um, for folks to be able to get broadband to their home, but you still have low rates of adoption. Um, that you know, I want to scratch further on that and figure out you know what's what's going on there. Is it digital literacy? Is it making sure that um, you know? I got to tell you, you know, I used to I used to work at a I used to work at a law firm where. Uh, you know, you have these old lawyers who would like record their notes and have a secretary <laughs> transcribe them, right? Um, just really a dinosaur. Um, and, and so, you know, is it is it in fact the case that for some communities, if they have a lot of elderly folks who just don't, you know, they're thinking the internet doesn't doesn't help me. I don't need that. Um, is it, you know, is it the fact that you have a lot of uh, internet to the home, but you just have folks who don't have uh, equipment? Uh, and so it's a matter of, you can have the fastest connection there is, but you don't have a computer. Uh, and so that's why I'm excited to hear uh, that there's a way that folks can get affordable computers uh, if they pass a digital literacy class. I think that. But, um, 
No, I wouldn't be here anymore. Um, you know, but it, it, it may, like a lot of things, uh, it may be there's no one one answer, there's no one solution. Um, there are a lot of different answers that may have to be tailored in a lot of different ways. Um, but I, I, I do want to hear. Um, uh, I think digital literacy is a is a clear component of solving this digital divide problem. But I really think it's also a matter of making sure that internet is more ubiquitous uh, is also a real key. Okay, then we'll start. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the president of the service provider. So I probably have this a little different description sure. in the room because we, we build and operate by opt-in networks. We, we deal off the FCC at any rate. Luckily, we've never met you. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we've never met you. Not the yeah. We'll go back to that. So, you know, we, uh, we use the e-rate program a lot you know, with, with uh, school libraries, we build the businesses, and one may be request, and then we told this to the other commissioners. So the biggest problem we face when we build fiber, and we'll spend over $100 million this year to, to build fiber in 21 states. Mm -hmm. But if you take like a UG Wyco and Allen or, or Mayor James here in Kansas City, mm -hmm. and maybe part of us because we're a hometown company, but, but we went to the city and said, hey, look, we want to expand our fiber footprint for, for all schools, businesses, et cetera. And both of those governmental and makes the same way worked with us great. <laughs> Not only did we help put their facilities up, we, we, you know, we got fiber down both sides of the trees. We're all over the east side. So we don't serve end users, but we, we serve companies that ultimately serve end users. Sure. But the problem is, for every good UGY, Codoro, Linux, or Casey Moe, and I won't name the city. So okay. we'll win an e-rate contract to, to hook up a school that desperately needed bandwidth. And some of these are small towns, some of them are huge cities. But they want to charge us a right-of-way fee, mm -hmm. or they will want to make the permitting process so tough. Mm -hmm. Or you run into an electric company that won't let you go on the lines. And I know, I know there's rulemaking yeah. out there. It's probably the FCC needs to maybe work, and I hate to say enforcement, but, but encourage folks to follow the rules a little more because, you know, for every success story in Kansas City, where again, we've got fiber all over the east side, so folks are now opening businesses on trees and hooking to our fiber because they've got, you know, good connection to the internet, where they did before. Again, you get other cities that can't. So anything you can do to push that at the commission or help or let us service providers know and help and the, that, that, that's great. I mean, that's the first building block to help me. I think everything else I'm talking about. Yeah, so thank you for that perspective. Um, and and uh, it is something that I'm thinking through. And, and there are a lot of um, you know proceedings that are starting to come through this, so I don't want to get into a whole lot. Um, because we are seeing that, you know, I know you're talking about e rated a lot of other programs, but it's also been something that folks have started to raise with 5G. Uh, because you know 5G, you're talking about going from you know nationwide. We have about 200,000 cell towers. With 5G, you're talking about 10 times to 100 times that amount. And so having to come back to a locality and say every time we want to stick a little lunchbox small cell, you know how is it we have to go and do a whole right away process and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And so I do think it's going to be important to kind of. Um, right size our our permitting processes, um, and I understand you know this gets into training lawyers and in, in the <laughs> we won't get too far here. You know, federal preemption uh, because we're obviously the FCC, we're the Federal Communications Commission, right? What you're kind of talking about is local issues. right? What you're talking about, I got a problem. I got a problem. You know, I deal great with some localities. I don't do so well with some other localities. And so that gets into the, you know, and a lot of folks feel a lot of ways on that. Do you want the federals getting down into local? Sometimes maybe folks do want us to. Um, but but uh, I'm eager to hear more from you on your perspective uh, generally and how to find um, um, business on that. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, Rick Usher's dying to answer <laughs> that question too. <laughs> 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 Can you go in just a second? First, Alan. So you KCK, and uh, we're good partners with you tonight. Good. <laughs> good partners with you tonight. Some of that question. Uh, and I'll also say greetings from our mayor, David Alvey, who was mm -hmm. the students at Rockhurst. 
Um, and Dean Alvey, yeah. my dean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I I I didn't get too many jugs. Justice under God. <laughs> I didn't get too many jokes, so I didn't see Dean Alley too much. Um, but please say hi to Dean Alley and let him know that one of his Rockers guys has grown up. That's <laughs> <laughs> not too many years. So. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't clean the uh, chalkboard. And then uh, also want to send greetings from Marina Mahoney, who is also in Mad Lion with your mother, um, and, and it's very fun. Please uh, say hi. Go to the right. Go to the my mom. Yeah, please do. As well. uh, I guess one of the things that we're grappling with, you mentioned digital redlining, uh, I think we're starting to see that potentially show up in 5G mm -hmm. uh, deployments and the uh, agreements, you know, sort of simultaneously the carriers are trying to strike local agreements in some cases while they're also seeking to preempt that the federal government and also working at the state legislative level to remove the ability of cities to control their right of way, control publicly owned publicly managed, publicly paid for right away in, in almost every instance. Mm -hmm. um, and what one of the downside effects of that, I think, for digital equity is that it, it eliminates the ability, uh, and we're seeing this now with agreements, to say, all right, you want to run 5G along I-70 and I-35, where you commercial, commercially it makes sense, that's your the best customer base to go first, but you can't just you know, jump over and ignore it and maybe not come back for another 10 years mm -hmm. the other areas of the community that, that need service. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, some, in a lot of cases are the ones who are relying more on uh, mobile devices for those kind of key services and educational needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess you know, from the city perspective, it's how do we continue to be able to manage this publicly owned, locally managed right away an asset and also uh, ensure that, uh, as with other franchise agreements, whether that's with gas companies or other things, that that service is provided uh, ubiquitously and is available for for everyone. And so I got to say, um, you know, five the, the 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 rules for five G are being written right now, which is basically what you're saying, um, and how five G is going to. Um, come out is being written right yeah, now, so that, that, that troubles me. Um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, we should talk, uh, because I am eager to hear more on that. Um, because 5G, we do know, you know, 5G is, is uh, you know, the real 5G that I think we're all reading about that is, you know, the hyper-technical artificial intelligence and augmented reality and virtual reality and driverless car and all this kind of stuff. I think we're some years away from that, to be honest. Um, but, you know, hyper speeds, gigabit, gigabit speeds that, that 5G is promising, um, you know, I think is a little bit, a little bit closer. Uh, and so hearing that there are communities that are, I, 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 you know, so I fully recognize um, you know, it's going to be harder for 5G to get rolled out to rural areas right away. You know, I recognize the, 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 the density and the populated, you know, bringing it to, to, to densely populated areas is, is part of, you know, the rollout plan. Um, but it bothers me to hear, gives me um, some concern to hear that even within urban corridors now, uh, we're, we're hearing 5G kind of ubiquitous. Um, as I think it should be, and so um, 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 I, I, I want to follow up with you and um, hear a little bit more, so that we can, um, so that I can weigh in my voice on how I think 5G, 5G is a judge of the I think Darren Beacon, I run a nonprofit civic organization here called PC Digital Rhyme. I was also on one of the, the, one of the media networking groups. On oh, good. Okay. So, did the, the one that makes so you come back to PC? Could be that meeting? I don't know from the big one. Mm -hmm. we, we, we did it all through calls. Um, went, to, went to a couple of them, but get out there, get out there uh, periodically. Okay, good. Try, try to get to our senators. Um, got a little bit different question, uh, and I don't know that there's a, a regulatory piece for the FCC here, but. Um, no problem there. <laughs> the, the, uh, there's there's a there's a, a new digital divide I think that's emerging that we don't talk about very much, uh, and and it's the freedom of wealthy people to not have technology. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it from a from a school's perspective, 
you know, when you look at when so we focus all this, you know, you gotta have so there's, there's a real divide where kids are at a disadvantage of you know the homes they grow up and don't have the internet or don't have technology. Now all the districts that have you know one one initiatives and showing mission schools, they've got a whole task force that's like, oh wait a minute, we don't like this very much. Um, you know, was it a thing our kids school last night? Uh, there was a doctor who was there getting all this information about all the bad effects of you know, having phones on kids and how much, you know, we, we don't let our phone, kids have phones until they're in eighth grade, there's this wait till eight initiative and all these things. But these things like wait till eight and these sort of uh, now movements to mitigate the bad effect of technology for kids are probably having in, in wealthier neighborhoods than what parents' means. And there's a certain freedom that you have to do that when when you're not worried about, you know, do you have the skills? Because because kids in our kids have the skills. Kids at our kids' school, kids at Rockers, you know, they've got they've got the skills no matter kind of what their background is, they're getting that. Mm -hmm. uh, is there from a I mean, so you've got two divides. On the one hand, you've got the lower end, you still need to have you can't have people that don't have skills, that don't have access. You know, you, you've got to have that, but I don't know, there's I, I don't know if there's a way to to take advantage of the fact that you know there are people that still don't to make that initial adoption better and, and get to a point where you don't need to learn all the bad lessons firsthand in order to adopt practices that are best in sort of the, the second wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't heard it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard it said that way. Um, you know, I got to say, uh, the way I think about it is, you know, if there are rich people problems, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, you know, so making sure that we don't take our eye off the ball for for um, youths that need to learn how to code, right? Because I'm meeting with all these, um, I'm meeting with Google and Samsung, and I'm not, you know, I probably shouldn't have drawn out particular names in the first place. Tech companies will say, uh, and making sure that we are developing the pipeline of diverse candidates that we can hold them accountable for if we're on focus on. Making sure that we have kids who know how to be engineers and coders, and they can be the technological innovators for the future is what I'm concerned about. Um, and then again, like I, like I shared earlier, um, you know, tech, technology is, is something that uh, a lot of folks are going to, technology is not just like one of those things where uh, it, it's, it's far off in the distance. Almost all of us now, online education, I think, is a powerful platform um, to making sure that people who need additional skills, need additional training, uh, a lot of jobs, like I said, not in the far off future, are going to have a technological component to them. And, and if folks are going to be able to uh, have those jobs, they need to have the skills. They need to have core competencies that include certain technological skills. Uh, and so I think training, getting retraining, uh, making sure that folks have uh, those essential um, competencies it's something that I'm focused on. That's not a youth problem, that's an adult problem. That's you know, making sure that um, um, people get the jobs that they need problem. So, yeah. And at the library, um, this coming Monday yeah. night at, at the Plaza location, we're having Mary Ann Wolf, who's written a book called Reader from Home, and it talks about how all this digital technology is having a cognitive effect on our ability and our children's ability to read. So, if you want more information about this, go to the Plaza Library on Monday at 6 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, nice. so I'm being told that we only have time for one more quick question. So, he's the bad guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, not least, right? Uh, I mean, I'm a council member on that subject, and uh, also I've served on the news app in the intergovernmental advisor. And yes, I was making the trips to DC. Yeah, almost on the most of the days. Good. That's so important. Thank you for your service. Got a chance to really see some of these movies. I have so many questions. I'm going to narrow down to one. Uh, and it's something that has begun to arise with uh, the densification of small cells and, and the beginning of 5G. 
um, where we're now getting residents who are coming to us very concerned about RF, RF emissions, and, and uh, the safety of that. And we understand this is a federal thing, and we can't intervene here and won't. Uh, but we have to rely on the FCC to give guidance to the cities and to the residents to assure that this is okay. And there's a docket open right now at the FCC. It's been open for about five or six years. <laughs> the only our commissions. Not yet. We're fun, not yet closed. Probably working on it. Um, I'm wondering just kind of your thoughts around this and, and um, uh, what kind of guidance you can give the, the city leaders uh, as we interact with their citizens. And this is becoming more and more local. I'm sure enough. Hard thing to deal with, and we get the promise and the hope and the, the, the capacity and the speed and so forth that's, that's coming through 5G. But we also have an obligation to keep our citizens safe. Totally. Uh, uh, the, the, the real answer is if it's an open proceeding, I probably shouldn't prejudge it. I have read the record. Um, I'm actually not studying on that. Um, and, you know, but my. Um, and I have no doubt that there are folks that are doing testing and um, um, assessing and analyzing that and making sure that it's safe. Um, and that dovetails in, in, in the second part of my answer. So the real answer is I don't want to think about it. Even if I did, I probably couldn't share it. <laughs> <laughs> it's open to see um, that kind of going on. But my real answer also is that I'm a father of, of a three and a half year old and a five month old. Um, and so uh, I completely understand. We want to be safe uh, and make sure that um, um, we're not going to um, have deleterious health effects for, for any of us, uh, least of all our, our most vulnerable. Um, and so uh, I have no doubt that this will be an issue that um, I'll have to deal with and solve. And, and uh, I'll, you know, I know you, you come with some frequency, we'll see uh, how that matter unfolds. That's the last question. Thank so, you. Commissioner, we want to tell you that we, we are a support team for you here in the right. city. So if you ever need any help or guidance or answer any questions, we're here to help too. So everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick statement. I'm so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of all of you all, Friday afternoon, our land is meeting at 10 30 or more. So pretty Friday night and night. And I really want to call this out to Commissioner Starks. You've seen, and this is not unusual, this is a typical makeup of right. a monthly meeting. It's providers, it's grassroots, neighborhood associations, it's nonprofits, it's schools. We come together every single month. And uh, I kind of want to put you on the spot to say um, this is what we do. We've been doing this for five years, and we hope that in your new role and coming from Kansas City, you can just help to continue to shine a bright spotlight on the work that we are doing in Kansas City. And not, not um, to do anything more than just put credit where credit is due. Because of the work of this lady right here and that, that gentleman in the back, uh, you know, we have in this, in this public library system one of the absolutely strongest anchor institutions of any city to be able to do this for you. And they regularly allow us to use this space and host these meetings. And we've got leaders from um, organizations, big and small. And um, we hope, and Angela's been so great uh, with the National Regional Inclusion Alliance to give lots of shout outs to the work we do. And it's representative of work that coalitions, some that are just starting up and others that have been around for a long time are really trying to continue to do to say this work really matters. So I just didn't want you to, to go without giving a special shout out to all these folks and, and to know that it really does matter, uh, no matter how diverse our backgrounds are and where we're coming from. And, and we hope that you can take that back with you to work you do. I sure will. Keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.